Okay, so this is your review for Unit 2, which is the focus of diabetes and food molecules that uh, can be used for energy or building. Um, so our whole focus for this unit is basically around diabetes. So let's run through this. This will help you out for the test that's coming up in the very near future. So what does it mean to be diabetic? You need to understand that diabetes is high blood sugar. All right, we should always have some sugar in our blood, but diabetes is uh, high blood sugar for a prolonged period of time. So that means that for some reason, blood, uh, the sugar that's in the blood is not actually getting into the cells. So it's continually floating around in the bloodstream. Uh, and since it's continually flowing around in the bloodstream, uh, your kidneys will end up processing it. So it'll take it out of the bloodstream. And then that person that has diabetes will then get rid of it into the toilets and urine. So um, we need to understand how negative feedback loops connect into all of this. And so let's see if we can go through some of these processes real quick. Um, so, hold on a sec. Sorry about that. Um, so, negative feedback loops are all about where the end product actually turns off the system. So, something triggers the system where as it builds up, uh, it, the end product will end up shutting off the system again. So, it's much like a thermostat in your house, where a thermostat you might set for uh, let's say 68 degrees. If the temperature falls below 68 degrees, it sends a signal all the way down to the furnace, and the furnace kicks on, heats the house, temperature in the house starts raising back up. Once it gets to 78, the thermostat sends another signal back to the furnace to turn off the furnace. So we see this in blood sugar uh, on a upswing and downswing of it. So if blood sugar is high, that means that we have a lot of glucose in the bloodstream as it is. We have neurons that, can, neurons that can take in information and understand how much glucose is in the blood. It'll send a signal down to the pancreas. The pancreas then releases insulin, and insulin is going to act as our little key that's going to bind to the insulin receptor, which will allow the body to suck up that glucose. So the body cells then take up that glucose, which causes the blood sugar levels to fall down. Um, we can also store, if the cells are um, completely fine, they have enough glucose, we can also take that glucose in uh, to the liver and form a large polysaccharide called glycogen. So there's two ways that we can actually get glucose out of the blood, but it's all reliant on insulin uh, for being able to take the glucose out of the blood. So once it comes back down to the bottom, right, to the normal level, um, the pancreas will then stop making insulin because insulin is very valuable. It's costly to make. It'll turn off the insulin and the, the uh, blood sugar is stable at that time period until maybe um, it either uh, eat again and we spike the glucose back up. We have to go through the system again. Regardless, the end game turned off the system. We also have a negative feedback loop that's on the back half. So on the back half here, we don't have enough glucose. So we send a signal to the pancreas again, but this time the pancreas, instead of producing insulin, is gonna produce glucagon, which is another hormone. That glucagon will stimulate the liver to take that glycogen, right? And what glycogen is, once again, is a polysaccharide where there's lots and lots of these glucose molecules all together. And the glucagon stimulates an enzyme pathway that severs the bonds in that glycogen and now all these little circles which are glucose are in the bloodstream so the bloodstream's glucose goes back up so once again this is a negative feedback loop so the the basic flow would be something like this where you have a that turns into b which turns into c we've got this cascade of stuff maybe we have an enzyme back here that's called x we have an enzyme back over here that's called y when c's volume gets to the point that our body wants it will come back and turn off the system, maybe by turning off the enzyme X. So that's basically what's going on here, where we have a product that's being uh, produced, insulin, and that insulin will be turned off once the blood glucose levels go down, or uh, glucagon being produced so that the glucose levels get back up to where we need to, and that would turn off the glucagon being produced. Uh, conversely, a positive feedback system would be where 
you have A turning into B turning into C, but then the C causes this to go even faster, so we end up getting more of this component, so it speeds up and makes the system go even faster over and over and over. So we talked about this one being um, childbirth, where we have contractions of the uterus. Um, those contractions, one contraction will lead to, let's say the first contraction between the first and second contraction, excuse me, was um, four hours apart, all right? And then that contraction will lead to the next contraction, the third one, to actually be closer, and we end up seeing that it's two hours apart. And then the third will lead to the fourth, which will then be maybe an hour from that last one, and then on and on and on. So we keep getting this continual progression of contractions coming closer and closer together, where the end result here of a contraction actually speeds up when the next contraction will occur. Uh, blood, if um, we have a breakage of uh, capillaries, arteries, veins, uh, and the blood spills out of our um, vessel system. Uh, we have thrombocytes and a whole cascade of different proteins that'll actually help plug that clot or plug that damage um, and allow the blood to clot. And that blood clotting system is also a positive feedback system. All right, so at least you have two examples of positive feedback systems. Um, this all connected to our understanding of uh, the models that you made. If you remember the models that you made and you got graded on, um, this uh, set of words would be something that we would be looking for on the test that you understand how they all connect together, right? So if blood sugar concentration starts going up, right? So those hard brackets mean concentration. If that blood sugar starts going up, then the pancreas is going to release insulin into the blood. We kind of talked about this in the negative feedback just a little bit ago. And that insulin then will, if we are, let's just draw a basic cell, now that you definitely know cell membranes. Right, so here's our cell membrane. These two lines represent the phospholipid bilayer. This protein is going to, uh, this doorway protein is going to be the glute, oh, sorry, glute for transporter. And then on the surface of the cell membrane, you will also have a binding spot, which is a glycolipid glycoprotein, uh, basically a protein flag system um, that will receive our little insulin. And so insulin will bind to the insulin receptor, which causes a signal to go over here to this doorway and the doorway, which was closed, and here's glucose out here, and this is inside the cell. This would be the blood system, right? This is your artery or your capillary or your vein. The insulin sending the signal over to the doorway opens the doorway, and then glucose will be able to pass into that body cell, right? So you have to be able to uh, draw a basic diagram of how this works uh, and be able to label it on the test, right? Very similar to the quiz we had. All right, so uh, we also made some graphs. We, if you remember, we did those blood serums uh, for Anna Garcia, patient A, patient B, and in that scenario, we had to make some graphs. So we're gonna ask you on the test to be able to interpret what's going on with the graph. So if this is time on your x-axis, and this is concentration of materials on the y-axis, so I'm just gonna put a hard bracket for concentration, we might have a um, person eats uh, a bunch of glucose, right? And in a glucose tolerance test, it's a liquid that they consume. We would see that the glucose would start going up, right? Because it's in the bloodstream now. Uh, what we should see is that line should come back down, right? We should get it back to a normal level. And I probably shouldn't have brought it all the way down. I probably should have had it at a level that is tolerable around 120, 70 to 120, something in that range. Um, but if a person has diabetes, then this line stays up high, right? Because the glucose is not getting out of the blood. So what brings this slope or this hill back down to this line down here um, is insulin. So if I change colors, we should see insulin with that increase. We should see insulin's concentration start going up as well. But as it starts making its effect, it should come back down, right? If a person 
is type 2 diabetic, type 2 diabetic. Remember that's a glucose sensitivity, or I'm sorry, an insulin sensitivity issue where they're making insulin, but it's not actually doing what it should do. So they end up producing lots and lots of insulin, and uh, we, don't, we don't actually finish that negative feedback loop. So the glucose stays in the blood, uh, the dotted line. If a person has type 1 diabetes, then that line never actually goes up. So it's, it would be a flat line at the zero because the pancreas is actually not making that glucose. Um, type 1 diabetes is very connected to genes. Uh, it is considered an autoimmune disease where the uh, immune system is actually destroying some of the cells in the pancreas, preventing uh, insulin from being produced, whereas type 2 um, often is in, and this one, sorry, type 1 is more of a child onset, right? so it could be from you know, the early years up to high school age when type 1 diabetes can actually start showing its symptoms. Type 2 is oftentimes later in life, um, and it's very related to um, activities of the person, uh, food. I'm not going to run out of space here. Right, food that they consume, their diet. So this one's a little bit easier to manage, but we have found over more recent research that actually both of them have some genetic ties to it. Right, so type 2 diabetes can run in the family. Type 1 obviously runs in the family because it's very connected to genes and the passing of genes from parents to offspring. So it just gives you a basic understanding. We're going to have some graphs on there. You're going to have to be able to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 um, on the test and be able to pull out some information about that. All right, uh, on to the next part, which was building and breaking biomolecules. Um, so first off, bio means life. Molecules means that they're a compound of some sort. Um, so when we're talking about building or breaking, there's very simple process that we have. So if we have we're going to use circles again. If this is glucose, and this is another glucose, we should be able to take these glucose molecules and bind them together, right? Actually make a bond. Uh, and the way that we do that is we pull out water between them. I'll show you how that kind of works on a, an actual compound uh, when we get to the different biomolecules here in a little bit. And that is called, when we pull out that water and join and make that bond, that's called dehydration synthesis, right? Because we're actually building a molecule, but we're dehydrating, we're pulling water out. The reverse process can also be done, or if you had a compound, right? Or I'm sorry, um, two uh, monomers stuck together, we could put water in, which will break the bond, and we call that hydrolysis, right? So if you're building, Right, if we're actually making things bigger, we're, we're trying to produce polymers from monomers, whereas in hydrolysis, we're taking a polymer and we're turning it into a monomer. Right, so one is going towards a polymer, one's going away from a polymer, right? That makes sense. Hopefully it does. If not, um, I will talk to you in class. All right, so let's talk about the carbohydrates. So carbo... Hydrates, meaning that it has carbon and basically water. So we're in a formula of CH2O. I don't know where this black line is coming from. Let's just change it right there. Right, where we have an X. So we should see equal amounts of oxygen to carbon and probably double-ish the amount of hydrogen on the molecule. So <clears throat> this one right here, glucose, you can see at each corner is going to represent a carbon, right? And that's why they're organic is because they have carbon in them. So one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So we should see this molecule being C6H12O6. I just did the math, six here, six times one, six times two, six times one. That's how I got this. And if I went through and counted, I would get that, right? So we should see one oxygen, two oxygens, three oxygens, four oxygens, five oxygens, six oxygens. So it matches that, and then we double up our hydrogen. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So carbohydrates are going to have similar amounts of carbon to oxygen, right? Um, oftentimes, it will be represented as a ring like this. Um, it could be a hexagon or a pentagon a lot of times. Um, we'll see some pentagon ones, especially when we're looking at a nucleotide. 
uh, because the nucleotide has a sugar in it as well. Uh, but carbohydrates, we should see that. This is direct energy, right? This is direct energy. Our body uses this, and it's glucose, right? So it's in your bloodstream. Your cells feed on it. Mitochondria use it to make ATP. This is direct energy for your body. But we can also build it and make polysaccharides. Right, so polysaccharide is lots of glucose molecules all linked together. So it would be glucose, 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 or glucose, fructose, galactose, right? All these little monomers, which are monosaccharides, would all be linked together to make a polysaccharide. So starch is an example of a polysaccharide. If you remember, we did the food test lab where we tested for glucose and we used Benedict's solution. That was the one that we heated up. Just going to put Ben, right? Benedict solution. And if glucose was in the unknown substance, it turned an orange or a red color, right? And it originally started as like a light blue. Um, the polysaccharides we tested with iodine solution. And when iodine, which has like a reddish hue to it, it comes in contact with starch, it turns a blackish purple color. All right, so this is a way for us to test for biomolecules in unknown solutions. We also looked at proteins, right? So key component of proteins is they have an amino group, they have a carboxyl group, um, and then they have this side chain. So amino group and an acid group, this is your acid group. <clears throat> and then this R side chain. R is not an element of the periodic table, it just means that that's the variable section. And in amino acids, there are 20 different Rs, which means there's 20 different amino acids that we can build with. So proteins do everything in your body, right? They are your structure components. They run reactions. They help balance um, that. I mean, insulin is a regulatory um, protein. You have things like collagen that is used in your bones and your skin to provide strength. Uh, we have keratin, which is found in your skin to provide durability. I don't know why I keep drawing that line through. I apologize. Um, so proteins do everything. We should always see amino acid carboxyl group. So what we would do is we take one of these. I'm just going to draw a generic shape of what you're kind of seeing here, right, where the R group is here. right? So this is the amino side. This is the carboxyl side. You'll have two amino acids joined together. right? If you look... I would pull off this OH and I pull off this H from the other one, right? So it'd be an OH over here and I pull an H off here. And when I pull those off, it joins them together. We make a peptide bond right there. And now we are forming a dipeptide or a tripeptide or all the way up to a polypeptide, which is just a big protein, right? It's a protein. Um, so we're pulling out that water. That's that dehydration synthesis. And we build that big, huge molecule. Now, remember, when you consume foods, you a lot of times consume these polymers, right? So we have to do um, a hydrolysis reaction to break it down to its simple monomers like the amino acids so it can be absorbed out of your bloodstream, go into your cells, and then your cells have the DNA, and they can arrange those amino acids into the orders that you need via the information of your DNA, right? So you are really what you eat. And we kind of talked about that, right? So whatever you consume, you break it all down, you build it all back up into you via the information of your DNA, right? So proteins do everything, amino group, carboxyl group, there's 20 of them. The only thing we didn't talk about yet is how do we test for them? So we use biurets to test for them in the unknown. So this is like a uh, more of a deeper blue, but if it's positive, it should turn purple if it's in the food or liquid or whatever it is that we're testing, right? So we have to know positive tests versus negative tests. Onward we go, lipids. So lipids have a lot of carbon and hydrogen as well, but very little oxygen, right? So you can kind of look at, there's three different groups of uh, lipids that we talked about. Um, before we get there, let's just talk purpose, right? So they are long-term energy, so we can store that up, long-term energy. They can insulate our body. They serve for shock protection. But they can also be hormones. And super important, they build cell membranes. 
right? Um, so this one right here, this is cholesterol, which we actually saw in the cell membrane, right? It provides antifreeze for the cell membrane, but also cholesterol can be manipulated using DNA and enzymes to turn into things like testosterone and estrogen. Right, so we could use this fancy lipid where we have um, these, you know, they got rings again, but notice that they're not really holding hands like in a carbohydrate. When we form these together, you'll end up seeing that they make a different kind of bond where there's a gap between them, right? So that's important to note. Whereas if we look at the, the cholesterol one, see how they're just kind of smooshed face against each other? Um, so this is a cholesterol molecule. The other one is in the carbohydrate family. But look at, here's a triglyceride, right? Three triglyceride, um, which we'll talk a little bit more when we get into the heart unit. Um, but triglyceride, you look at all those carbons and hydrogens, look how little oxygen there is. There's only six oxygens, but look at all those carbons. So this is not a carbohydrate because it has very little oxygen. And because it has little oxygen, it's also what we call nonpolar. So it has a hard time dissolving in water. Right? So triglyceride, lots of energy available there, um, but they're, they're kind of greasy, right? And this would be the test that you do for the lipids is the brown paper bag test. I know, super scientific, right? Where it actually changes um, from an opaque to more of a translucent color. We can actually see light kind of pass it through. Um, the last one is the phospholipid. So this is a phospholipid here. We've seen this now twice. So we talked about it when in our notes first time we were talking about lipids. But then if you look here, here's a cell membrane, right? Where we have those polar side head. This is where the phosphate is. Um, can dissolve in water, so outside the cell, inside the cell. But then we have these fatty acid tails here that serve as a nonpolar. So it provides this perfect barrier to keep the outside out and the inside in. So if you uh, didn't have the little protein doorways, which we'll talk about later, um, the things wouldn't be able to pass through the cell membrane very well. But all this lipids, right? So lipids are pretty diverse. They have a lot of different kinds of uh, lipids that we've talked about. So three categories, cholesterol, triglycerides, phospholipids, okay? Onward we go to nucleic acids. We've talked about nucleic acids in unit one uh, because nucleic acids are DNA and RNA, right? So this picture here is a nucleotide, which has a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. Now, this kind of looks like cholesterol because it's rings that are sharing face, but notice all the nitrogen in there. That's big difference. So all that nitrogen makes it a nitrogen base. The only other molecule we've looked at that had nitrogen was back here with the amino acids, right? But it wasn't in a ring. So those are key things to look for when you're trying to identify molecules. But the nucleotide, these bonds right here would be covalent bonds, nice and strong, hold that nucleotide together. Um, and if we were gonna go down a DNA molecule, right, we have the sugar to the phosphate to the sugar, right? Making a polymer now, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. All of that is covalent bond, nice and strong. And even to the nitrogen base, it would be nice and strong. But then remember DNA is double-sided and it's anti-parallel. So one side's opposite of the other across the center, it's gonna be a hydrogen bond, right? So we try, I'm trying to make dots, I'm doing very well here, All right? So across the center, it would be a hydrogen bond. And I'll talk about that more in the review video, video for the final exam. You just have to identify nucleic acids for this test. All right, last couple pieces here, calorimetry, right? So we're trying to measure heat. That was the purpose of this. Because heat uh, is giving you a, a direct relationship to the amount of energy that is in the food that you are consuming. So we connected this to nutrition labels. We talked about if a can of pop has 150 calories, right? we talked about how those are big C calories. That's like 1,000 
um, little c calories, which is what this equation is going to get us. This will get us little c calories. So this is actually, if we, if we put in little c calories, a can of pop is more like 150,000 little c calories. All right, we'll give you those conversions on the test. So calorimetry, if you remember, we had our can that had water in it. And for my example, I'll say that this has 50 mLs of water. Right, we put our food down here. We lit it on fire, released heat. We had a thermometer in here. Maybe the thermometer said 20 degrees Celsius to start with. And that temperature, uh, that heat warmed up that water. Temperature went up. Maybe the temperature went up to, I don't know, 25 degrees Celsius. So we should be able to use this equation, which will give you on the test. You'll have a calculator to do it as well. Um, and that food that we burned, let's say it started at, I don't know, 15 grams, and now it's all the way down to five grams. Um, you need to understand that this formula works for one substance at a time. So we're going to use this substance for water first, and then we can use the information of the food to calculate the calories per gram. So the mass of the water goes in first. So if we're going to try to find our heat or our Q or our calories, mass of the water is 50 mLs. Right, because each ml is equal to one gram, so that'd be 50 grams of water. Why is it doing that? Whoa, what is going on? Oh my gosh, hold on a second. Okay, let's try again. Sorry about that. Freak out pen. Uh, 50 grams. <clears throat> the C will give you is always 1.0 little c calories per one gram degrees Celsius. So we'll just plug in one point, try to use this mistake here, O for the C, and then delta means change, and T means temperature. So we had 20 to 25, that was 5 degrees. So if we multiply all this together, 5 times 1 is 5, times 50 is 250, whoa, little c calories. Okay. So... If we want to convert this to big C calories, we would have to divide it by 1,000. So you basically move your decimal point over 3. That's 0.25 big C calories. Okay. Then we could take how many calories per gram. So that's that many big C calories per looks like 10 grams of food. So if we want to figure out the calories per gram of that food, we would take that number, divide it by that number, and you end up getting your big C calorie per one gram, which would end up being a really small number in this haphazard example. All right? Hopefully that makes sense. If not, we'll do a couple more practice problems in class. Okay? All right. Last piece is diffusion and osmosis. So diffusion, uh, first we should say that these are passive processes, which means that there's no energy required. And it follows entropy, where we go from high, things will move from high to low. So diffusion is just that, things moving from high to low. Okay, so it could be a smell in the room where the smell is really high in one spot, and then it starts spreading out all over the place, right? and it's random molecular movement, so it starts spreading out. And eventually, in the future, you would end up seeing the smell is all over the place, all right? The little smell molecules, which actually smell is a chemical that you're receiving. It's a chemoreceptor in your nose and tongue that perceive that. So that would be diffusion. Osmosis is just the diffusion of just water. So we're just focusing on water, but the other things that are dissolved are gonna play a part. So let's look at those pieces. So hypotonic means that we have low amounts of the actual solute and high amounts of the solvent. So that means that there's lots of water. Whereas hypertonic is the opposite, where we have high amounts of solute, low of solvent, which means it has uh, less water. So then ISO means the same between the two locations. Now, 
these terms are relative, so you have to have two locations to compare to. So if we had a cell set up with a semi-permeable membrane down the center, so that's my membrane, and then if I had these big spheres of glucose stuck on one side where they actually cannot get through, for the sake of time, we're just going to consider the white area as water. <clears throat> This side would be considered hyper, and this side would be considered hypo. And so we have lots of water and we have less water. Water is going to move from the hypotonic to the hypertonic area. So water will go over here because if you look, there's a lot more red circles. It's like water wants to go hang out with the red circles to make them cooler. We want to be eh, the party is over here, right? So we're going to move over to this side. And if this was a flexible thing, you might see that this side would swell out, right? Or if you had it in a, a U-tube, right, you would see maybe the left side, the water level would go down, and the other side, the water level would go up, right? Um, the key is that you understand how this connects to diabetes. So diabetes, we have lots of blood sugar at one time, which causes the cells that surround the blood vessels to be hypotonic and they'll lose their water to that really sugary blood, making that person more and more dehydrated, which sends a signal up to the hypothalamus of the brain to want to drink more. So that person continually drinks and then they end up going to the bathroom a lot. The key is your body cells want to be isotonic with your blood. Right, so they, they should be balanced. We want the cells, um, if this is a red blood cell, we want the amount of water that's going in to equal about the same amount that's going out. That's proper. Right? So you always have to kind of balance by drinking and going to the bathroom uh, to get that volume just right. And your brain does that all by itself without you even thinking, which is kind of cool. All right, that wraps up our unit to review. Hopefully that helps out. Uh, you have a review guide as well. This should help you with the review guide. Um, I wish you the best of luck. If you have any questions, email your teachers. Science on.